Um, Balkan Forum is a regional peace building organization. We don't call it peace building, of course, but um, we are working to facilitate uh, dialogue and collaboration between um, the countries in the Western Balkans, but then working across sectors. Um, there are thematic areas, of course, that we are interested in and we are promoting more. And within those, it's the circular economy, one of them. It's the interlinkages between the education environment and labor market, because those are the three areas that work in the benefit of uh, uh, creating more uh, linkages between the Western Balkans countries and societies. Like you uh, would know that um, not long ago, um, the agreement has been signed within the Berlin Process Summit um, to enable people to work, uh, to travel uh, with ID card in the Western Balkans and freedom of movement of people especially is something that we have been advocating for for quite a long time. Then the education recognition of the diplomas of high school diplomas, universities is uh, another agreement that has been signed. And then regional cooperation, which we believe is very important, is the part of common regional market that has been agreed a while ago and for which there is a policy, there is a system, there is uh, mechanisms that enable that cooperation to have. And that is also something that we <clears throat> put quite a lot of emphasis and priority. Second area is the media environment in the Western Balkans, and we are more promoting media freedom and this media literacy, and then working on countering disinformation and misinformation and propaganda which has become more prominent now with the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And, you know, and, and there is a lot of evidence that it's not only coming from there, but there are local politicians and actors whose mindset uh, is um, still the one that did not uh, kind of uh, reform, if you will. Um, and so we are not talking about progressive politicians, but a group of politicians that continues to promote war and promote conflict and promote division in the Western Balkans, for which we are uh, quite strongly advocating against. Um, another area that we, we work quite a lot and, and uh, we, we kind of uh, put a lot of the resources uh, in is the regional uh, kind of cooperation, but within the EU integration kind of uh, path. Uh, for the Western Balkans. NATO is a separate issue, and we, we also um, kind of are interested to uh, build uh, connections between the countries. For example, in the Western Balkans, we have six countries, and that is like Western Balkans six. North Macedonia has become NATO member state, Albania two, and Montenegro. Uh, Kosovo and Bosnia are not, but they have presence. European and uh, NATO presence in both countries. And Serbia has a different view to NATO integration. They don't want to, and they have a policy of, uh, which is different from, from the other countries in here. But the, in the context of that kind of uh, collaboration in the Western Balkans, we look into how uh, uh, countries who are not members yet can benefit from North Macedonia's experience, from Albanian's experience, from Montenegrin experience. And then more broadly, when it comes to EU integration, we are looking into uh, Croatia's experience, into uh, Greece's experience, into Bulgaria's and Romania's experience, so that countries and societies and civil society can learn from, from those processes. It was founded in 2012. And that was an initiative by private um, U.S. foundations who are investing quite a lot in the Western Balkans. They are giving funds to uh, assist governments of the Western Balkans and civil society, media, free media in here, um, and plus the business sector. And so they have been working with the governments and other actors and coming up <clears throat> with the agenda that would facilitate some sort of you know, collaboration that does not necessarily mean is the contentious political foreign policy issues, but it's more building bridges between the societies that once have been in conflict or continue to be 
uh, hostages of, of irresponsible politicians. And that's how they identified the areas that could facilitate the, uh, that. Initially, it was the higher education as one of the areas that, that has that potential. Then uh, the um, energy um, and environment, uh, both two areas that are in common. And we can see now with the energy crisis how that has become even more prominent and that countries have to work together, not only as Western Balkans, but more broadly with Europe and globally into mitigating the uh, effects uh, of the uh, energy crisis. Uh, another area was tourism with a lot of potential. People move during the season, go from Kosovo and now even Serbia and Bosnia to Albania and other uh, coastal areas, Montenegro, and it has a lot of potential as, as, as a region. Um, and then it was like a human capital labor market. And, and in that specifically, we are calling more for brain circulation. Uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, brain gain uh, and those uh, things. But you know, if we cannot prevent people to leave Western Balkans uh, as they are leaving massively now, we are saying, well, are there opportunities within the Western Balkans so that people can work internally without necessarily having to see a, um, a, a prospects, better prospects in Western Europe or un, uh, in United Kingdom or United States. And the element of it is the work with diaspora that we do quite a lot. And we are not uh, promoting the return of finances of diaspora, but we are um, uh, promoting more the intellectual capital that our diaspora, meaning diaspora from the region, has outside so they have experience, they have now, you know, they have, do have now prominent roles like politicians and engineers and doctors that we really need. We need that knowledge, we need that experience uh, to come back in a way. I think there may be, there may be political issues. I mean, we can see how the situation today is between Kosovo and Serbia, for example, or how the situation in Bosnia is, is like, is, is not stable. Uh, but I believe primarily is, uh, it is because a uh, common regional market, which is the byproduct of the Berlin process, has clear kind of vision and goals and objectives and targets and funds and structures in place and everything is in there. So nothing is unknown, everything is known. And because all of the countries signed and then agreed on an agenda that is you know, building more economic uh, relations between the countries, then that is clear. While open Balkans, I see it more as an idea with no much clarity. And there, is, there, there are two concerns in that, I think. One is that idea, yes, it sounds good. It uh, helps the region more integrate economically. But the second thing is that it disconnects the region, at least how it is now, from the European market, European Union rather market. Common regional market does not have any of those. So common regional market at its heart has the integration of Western Balkans economically with the uh, EU, and then also delivering on certain standards within that. And that is what I believe uh, may be another kind of issue that, the, that, that Kosovo, for example, Montenegro and Bosnia-Herzegovina are reluctant to join an initiative that has not much clarity and eventually may more create division between us and the European Union than uh, kind of assist in that European integration path. Well, what I think is that, um, you know, um, what all agree, what all countries agree, including Kosovo and Serbia, is that Europe, uh, Euro integration uh, of the Western Balkans is something that we want to, all the countries want to, and that it's uh, almost existential for the Western Balkans to have this process in place and continue their EU integration path. 
And that is for many reasons. One, that we are not going to be able to join European Union without resolving the whatever uh, tensions that, uh, that may be there or political issues that may be between the countries. One. Second is the democracy. I mean, you know, we will need to have and deliver more in terms of maintaining democratic standards and advancing democracy in our countries. Third is the rule of law. We still have rule of law related issues and those are structural that we may not be able to join European Union with, with what we have so far. So we need to do a, a bit more in there and demonstrate um, quite seriously that we want a, a strong rule of law system and that we care for human rights and then we care for minority rights and we care for individual rights. So I think these are the things that everybody agrees in the Western Balkans. Now you create something different which may sound good, may be good at the end of the day, but that seems to have not be aligned fully with what all six countries want. And that's how this open Balkans may be, one, political, there are political issues, two, practical issues, three, the fear that if we are joining an initiative that is not clearly bringing us closer to the EU uh, kind of integration standards and, and, and uh, uh, kind of benefits that we are going to have, then why we would join. And let's say Kosovo and Serbia have larger problems. And let's say that Bosnia has a major issue in there um, because of Republika Srpska and be because of many other dynamics in there. Uh, but then Montenegro is the same. So it's not necessarily that it's fully political, but it's all also practical and it's pragmatic as well. And adding into that the, the uh, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, there is also fears that we may be opening doors to Russian influence in the Western Balkans. And you know, some of the countries fear that. Some of the countries think that may not be possible, like the three who are now part of the uh, Open Balkans initiative. But there are, you know, there are those issues that are, are coming to play. So to, to, to make it short is that when is clarity that Euro in, uh, European integration is the ambition, is the aspiration, there are no differences. Take that aside, then everything is a problem. Everything is an issue. You cannot make them agree on other things. I mean, the, while looking at the historically, uh, you know, having a historic background to this context that we are having today and the dynamics, I think it explains a lot itself. If we were thinking that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there was the end of the war, dissolution of this and fall of the Berlin Wall, and then end of the Cold War, I think we were not aware that it was not the end of the Cold War. Is It was the continuation that um, uh, of it, but in a different environment, in a different context. And, and Russian aggression against Ukraine explains that. And it's not only now, it's the Georgia. So you have Russian aggression even there in 2008 or 10, when, when was it? So there is a history of that. And it's, it's also the race for the values. And nations and countries that believe on certain values on democracy, on human rights, on rule of law, on freedom of speech, or freedom of media. They want European Union. They want NATO membership. They don't want any association with Russia. And then, in the other hand, you have, for political and historic reasons, for example, Serbia, that says, well, we cannot cut ties with Russia because of whatever affinity, because of policy, because they are supporting us to prevent Kosovo gain this membership in this and that. But I think it's at the end of the day, it's the values that people are driven by and countries are driven by. So it's not the expansion of NATO, as Russia says, 
that is creating a problem for Russia and is uh, uh, coming to the borders of Russia or narrowing the influence of Russia, but it's countries themselves, nations themselves, that don't want to do anything with what Russia resembles as values for them. So I think it's, that's, that's the clash of it, and it's not um, superficial. It goes deep, uh, and I, I think it's foundational. That's why when, when uh, the rhetoric by Russia is that we are threatened by NATO expansion, uh, you know, the question would be, is NATO forcing countries to become members, or is the aspiration of countries to become members? And it's always the second. North Macedonia does not want and did not want to become a NATO member state because NATO forced them, but because people wanted to become, because people uh, cherish the, the, the same values. It's not North Macedonia, or Kosovo, Albania, or any other country that uh, is becoming by force or wants to become by force EU member state. It's because of the values that people um, hold dear to. So I think, uh, you know, this, this kind of Russian rhetoric um, has been, will continue, and I think coming to the uh, bomb threats, that is real, and, and we have to be vigilant uh, in, in terms of that. Russian influence is real, it's quite big. There is plenty of evidence including with the um, uh, referendum in North Macedonia. There was evidence that there was Russian influence that made that fail, but hopefully it, it failed there, but it continued, and, and North Macedonia gained uh, NATO membership. It was the same in Montenegro. Uh, there is plenty of evidence that uh, Russia played a significant role even in there and continues to do so. And you, we, can, we can witness that in, in Kosovo's case and Bosnia's case. For example, last year you had Russian ambassador accompanying uh, uh, Serbian uh, Minister of Defense and uh, with the tanks and helicopters and airplanes, whatever, uh, w they went to uh, Kosovo border and you know, you had Russian ambassador like threatening Kosovo in there. You have a uh, Russian ambassador in Bosnia who is threatening Bosnia not to do a move to join NATO, which is like it speaks quite loudly only for those who are blind and deaf that does not uh, kind of um, maybe it, it, it's like just ignoring the fact that Russian influence is very big. And, and there has been uh, a lot of research that NGOs in Serbia recently did, and, and there is a, a quite extensive list of Russian associations and uh, Russian political activists and media and, uh, you know, cultural institutions who are basically working within the society and that is also true in North Macedonia. There has been uh, an extensive research time uh, three or four years ago. It has never been published, but there is evidence by name and by institutions who are basically spreading the rumors, uh, building this narrative that Macedonia or North Macedonia cannot survive because there are ethnic tensions, there are religious tensions, and, and so on. So I think we have to be quite uh, um, vigilant in terms of detecting the threat and countering the threat because one day those bombs will not be a threat anymore. Those bombs will explode. Those bombs will cause casualties. And that is easy in those kinds of situations to exploit uh, the vulnerabilities that uh, our countries have. There are, well, there is a network of NGOs that we are working, uh, or better say, three or four networks that, that all of them do bits and pieces of work. Like one is on diaspora, and that is diaspora individuals, and there are NGOs from the Western Balkans who are connecting with their diaspora. Now, in this case, like we would have a, 
uh, North Macedonian, let's say, NGO who is connecting with the North Macedonian diaspora, then we would have a Kosovar NGO uh, connecting with uh, Albanian Kosovar diaspora. Then, so it's it's these connections that we are building. We have them built amongst ourselves, and we want to build amongst the diaspora communities. Second is one that is civil society more uh, network, and that is looking more into Berlin process and to uh, contributing to relevant summits and uh, agreements that are coming as, as a result of that. Uh, with media, there is a group of, NG, of uh, media organizations, and, and one is uh, civil, my friends. So we are working with them uh, as well. Uh, part of it is it's, it's sort of education, part of it is awareness raising, part of it is capacity building, like media literacy so that people read, research, understand better, create an opinion, uh, not only by reading titles but by going into it and, and uh, uh, identifying clearly the source whether the source is trusted or not. So it's basic things that we wouldn't think uh, too much in, in today's kind of world with, you know, so digital, um, everything has become digital, and you have apps and you have all of these things that you may easily uh, lure yourself and forget that, that, you know, we are living in a reality. So we, we do quite a lot uh, of that kind of work. And sometimes it's conferences where we talk about very, kind of uh, uh, practical issues. We talk about, you know, sometimes broader global dynamics, but then bring that discussion to our context. And sometimes it can be North Macedonia, sometimes it can be Kosovo, sometimes it can be Bosnia and Herzegovina, sometimes it can be regional. But we keep reminding ourselves and the others that we have to do a bit more to educate ourselves to develop more skills, to develop more this critical thinking so that we are not trapped into propaganda, into disinformation that some do deliberately. And we as individuals, we as people, we as NGOs, take them as true. Yeah. <laughs> In Skopje, there is a lot favorite for me. It's, it's basically my second home, I consider it. I spent two years here from 1990 to 1992 before I left Skopje, went to Albania. So it's part of me that still lives in Skopje and will always uh, do. But there are, there are some areas that I, I go and visit. One is the like, Kale area, but the other one is Vodno. And then there are bits of the city that are really important that I cannot miss. Sometimes good bars, sometimes there is a theater play, sometimes so it's always feeling at home and then thinking, well, I want to go to, their, uh, to that neighborhood because I've been there uh, a while ago and, and just revisit. 